Okay, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Peter, chapter 4. We will be looking at verses 4 through 6. Is tolerance a a two-way street? No, it's not. It's unfair that Christians are persecuted because we believe in Jesus Christ, because we have given our lives to God, because we go to church, because we participate in conferences, and because we don't believe that living a life of partying and getting drunk and doing certain things that are detrimental to our health, that we're looked at as strange, you know, because we're not walking with the rest of the world. We're isolated. In fact, there's so many groups that think that if we can just remove the Christians from the world, we'd be a better place than we are now because they're so limited to do whatever they want without these people judging them on their moralities or lack of morality and so forth. So it's not a two-way street out there, is it? We will be suffering persecution. Jesus says you will suffer just as he suffered. And if you're an active Christian in your faith, uh, then you will be persecuted by people. You will be mocked. In fact, the world will not love you. Your family will even think that you're strange. How many of you have experienced that, that your family thinks that you're strange, that you're peculiar, you're, you're not normal, something's not right with you, you know, and, and they know it's, it's your Christianity. Jesus said this, these are the words of Jesus, by the way, and when Jesus speaks, we should listen. He said, blessed are you when they revile you, when they persecute you and say all kinds of evil things falsely for my name's sake. He said, blessed are you. It's a blessing when people revile you or persecute you or say evil things. It's a blessing. Remember that. I know it's not fun. I know it's not enjoyable. And our flesh surely does not want to be persecuted or we don't want to be laughed at. Uh, Too many are laughed at already. But realize that that is part of the package of being a Christian. A Christian that has faith in Jesus Christ. A Christian that wants to live for Jesus Christ. Wants Jesus oozing out of them and be a light to the community or to their friends and family members. You know, that's part of the package. Know that. Now, if you're not living for Christ, if you're not interested in living for Christ, so yeah, you're saved. Yeah, you accepted him. And yeah, you're going to heaven. You believe but you're not living in it and you're walking with the world, then something's wrong with your Christianity. And and I hope that you'll hear what God is saying today, that you need to wake up in these last days and set those boundaries for your life. Last time we met, we we looked at verses 1 through 3. We looked at how Christ suffered in the flesh. He died on the cross at the hands of man. In fact, our sins were laid upon Him. And yet He ceased from sin... Because he took upon the sins of the world, upon his shoulders for you and I. And then we looked at the last verse there in 3 last week and how we have spent enough time like the Gentiles that it's now time to uh, live for the Lord. No longer living for the flesh, for the lust of men, uh, the lasciviousness, the drunkenness, the partying, the uh, abominations and idolatries. We can't live that way any longer, but we need to live for Christ. And that's the context that Peter is speaking about. In fact, the whole book of First Peter is about suffering, isn't it? And how the church has suffered throughout the ages for their faith in Jesus Christ. And so the theme of today's message is they think you strange. They think you strange. If you are a believer, then people will think that you are strange. And so he says in verse 4, in regard to these, to the works of the flesh that we just read, the lasciviousness and lust and drunkenness, in regards to these things that we're not supposed to partake of any longer, uh, we're not to be walking in that fashion, in regards to that, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dispensation. Let's stop there. I know there's a, another 
sentence there in that verse, but I want to stop at that point there because Peter is saying that they think, that is the world thinks, your neighbors think, those that are around you, your family members think, that you're strange. They think you're strange. You're weird. You're not the same person. It's almost like somebody took the person inside your body, pulled them out, and stuck someone else in there. And now this person is living inside of you because you're not that person that we used to know. In fact, you're a foreigner. You know, the word foreigner is is a more better word in the Greek to use here. They think that you're a foreigner. You don't belong here. People will have foreign exchange students come to their homes. And they're always interesting, aren't they? Because they're so different than you. Their culture is different. They eat different. They dress different. They think differently. And so you're spending time with them because you want to get to know them. Why do you think this way? Why do you talk that way? And it's their culture because they're foreigners to this land. Uh, They're not living here. They don't belong here. And so they think it's strange that you, who were a part of their lives at one time, uh, their family, then all of a sudden you're different. Something has happened. You've changed. Then Peter even adds to clarify one aspect of this change is that you used to run with them in this same flood of dispensation. The word run there means that you used to be in company with them. You were their friends. They were your, you, you know, you, they were your pals. When I worked for Southern California Edison, I hung around about five guys. We all got hired on the same time. I was about 21 years old and they were right, roughly right around there. Same age. And we'd hang around each other. We'd go to work in the morning. We'd go to the same truck, get the burritos and the coffee, you know. Go to work, talk to each other about our family, get to know one another. Afterwards, we loved the same sports. We'd go play basketball together. Then we'd go hit the pub, you know, and have some pizza and, and beer and get drunk and laugh and joke, you know. We hung around each other. I, I hang around the same crowd. We all had crowds that we hung around with in school or high school and college and, and even today, as adults, you move into a neighborhood and there are certain people that you, you like and you get along with and they become your crowd, you know? They're your crowd, your, your buddies and so forth. You can go work out with your buddies, you know? They, you have buddies that you work out with and friends that you work out with. If you're into that, you know, in basketball or sewing, some of you have knitting, you know, and, and crafts and things like this. You have those buddies and that's what he's talking about. You used to run with them in that same flood, but in this sense here, you ran with them in wastefulness, in this type of living. And now that you are no longer running with them, they think that you're weird. They think that you're strange. This word flood there means overflowing. We used to, uh, we used to do everything together. <clears throat> some of us were married, some were single. Uh, a friend of ours got married up in Santa Barbara, nice little place and so the guys thought let's all go up there together have a good time this was before I was a Christian so I have to clarify that and so we're on our way up there and I drove my Grand Prix little you know low rider you know driving it up there to Santa Barbara we were all you know 21 years old with our suits on and ready to you know hit the party scene and so forth now I was married so I mean I was flooded with excess in my life you know, and there I was, and, and we would do dumb things that 21-year-old kids did. You know, we were just hilarious. We were laughing and busting up and drinking and trying to have a good time. We literally drove up to the place, and there was this one guy that, that he just stuck out from the rest of us because of his nationality. And so the rest of us were like his bodyguards. And so we'd go into stores with our hands in our suits like this, you know, and we're all looking around, and he was, he was the guy that we were supposed to be protecting. You know, on our way down... Uh, we hit some of the nightclubs that were in the area, and there was a friend of ours that uh, he was probably a little older than us by a few years, so 23, maybe 24, and it was just so strange that, that when we hit these clubs, he was hitting on the older women, and I'm talking 50, 60 years old. You know, and we were just laughing. You can just imagine all the jokes and so forth, and, and just all the way back home. And this was the group I hung around with. These were my friends. And then I become a Christian and I no longer hang around them. You know, God pulls me away from them. He's like, well, let's go out to the pub. I'm like, oh, I really can't go. I have to get home. You know, I've got other things to do. 
got to go to church, you know, I've got to do this, I'm involved in a ministry, God has given to me, and I need to be faithful to that, and you don't have the same desire, something changes, and next thing you know, they're, they're going, you're strange, something happened to you, where did Reuben go, you know, where did you take him from, you know, did some alien come down and snatch you away, because it's weird to them, that you no longer want to live that type of life, what Peter is doing here is he's giving us a picture of a pagan world, of a pagan world. This is a world that, that you can go to a temple and offer up sacrifices to idols, literal sacrifices. You can actually hire temple prostitutes to have sex with in their worship, in their form of worship. This is what was happening. And they were participating in all this and all of a sudden they get saved and they no longer wanted to do that. And they thought, you're strange, you're strange. You mean you're strange, I'm not strange. You're the one that's really strange. And I look back at my life and I think, how stupid, how strange for someone to even do some of the things that I did. Because it makes no sense morally, practically even, you know, some of the things that happen. You just go, why would I even think about doing something like that? Because it's a riotous life. It's a sinful life. And you don't think. It's all based on what? Passions and lust. And, and, and when you allow those to run freely, you look like an idiot. <laughs> you look stupid, you know, because you're living after the, the lust of life itself. But as believers, we don't live that way any longer. We're not to live that way any longer. Your family, your friends, they think that you're strange now because you don't think like them anymore. You know, even your thinking has changed from their thinking. It, it's really strange. I was um, speaking with uh, David Guzik, and another pastor came up. And um, you would know him. I'm not going to mention his name. And he was talking normally like we all talk normal. Well, I just happened to see him. He was joking around with some of the guys. And he, he Actually, I saw him on a video, I'm sorry, remember now, now I'm remembering, I saw him on a video, and so he was sharing his life story, and all of a sudden he reverted to his gang talking, you know, Orale, ese, you know, and all of a sudden he was just like, whoa, that sounds so strange to hear coming from him now, when you hear him teaching and he's speaking normally, but that was his old life, and he no longer talks that way. You know, there's a time to grow up as believers, we need to grow up, we're no longer like that anymore. It's hard to do that when you're stuck in that, and when you grew up in that, and all of a sudden God is saying now, but you're no longer of the world, come out of the world. You're now a different person. And it's hard to leave those things. I, I know that for me, growing up in that, I had to literally focus and, and with effort to try to change my language, to try to change my speaking so that I hopefully sound a little more clear, more precise in, in what I was trying to say instead of just all over the place, you know. And it was hard because I had to really try to, try to do that. It was effort for me to do something like that because I knew I couldn't continue to speak that way. It just didn't make sense to work in this world and speak like that. Orale, Basque, what do you want? Leave me alone, it's it. You know, I don't need this stuff. Chale. You know, <laughs> all, you know it's like, what are you, what, who are you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> What are you talking about? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I work with you here. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize, sir. <laughs> you know, you got to speak normal. You got to change. You know, and, and when you change, and your friends see that, they think that um, you know you're strange. You're, you're different. You hang around your your family, and your family's so used to being in darkness. You know, because you, you were in darkness there, and all of a sudden you show up, and you're this light, and you're different, and they're like, oh wow. Who is this guy? You know, he comes into our parties now and he actually disrupts things. He doesn't keep with the flow. You know? and, it, and it's almost like, like little rats scurrying around the darkness trying to find it because lights kind of come into their, their lives. And because of that, it gets difficult because you're so different now. And now people are adjusting to who you are now who are not the same person that you were. Now you're talking about God and Jesus in church and stuff like this. And it's like, man, you used to just sit with us and laugh and joke and have a beer. What's wrong with you? You know, you're strange. I had uh, family members, uh, when we were going to another Calvary, we'd been trying to witness to them. 
And so we would take every opportunity. That was our whole focus was to witness. Whenever we went to family events, witness. Ever went to Christmas or New Year's, witness, witness, witness. Talk about the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Well, we, we got them to come to church with us. And so after several visits to church, um, they made arrangements to talk to the pastor about me. And so they were in the office, and the pastor told me this afterwards, and they were in the office with him, and they all sat down, and, and they said, uh, we, we want to talk to you about Reuben. He says, I mean, I understand he's got his, his religion now with Jesus and so forth, but could you ask him to kind of tone it down? Because every time he's over our house or family, it's always about Jesus. And he's saying Jesus this and Jesus that and Jesus did this and Jesus wants to do that, you know, and so forth. And so they were complaining that I was always talking about Jesus. And so the pastor, thank God, gave him wisdom and says, I wish I had 12 more of Reuben's. You know, and they were like, okay, didn't make any sense, you know. But you know what happened? Because I stood my ground, he stood his ground. Virginia stood our ground, our family stood our ground. They came around they actually accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. And now they're strange to other people. You know? And that's what happens when you stand your ground, even through the mockery and so forth. Even when your family says, you're always in church. Why are you always in church? Don't you ever do anything else? You know? Why are you always there on other nights besides Sundays? <laughs> Why do you go there on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and, and Thursdays and then conferences? Who goes to conferences on your weekends when you should be resting? You know, who does that? I do. I want to know Jesus. I want to know who he is, what he wants. I want him to bless me. I want to live my life for him. That's who. Now, there are times when Christians think that you're strange. Why would you go to a conference? Wait a minute, you're a Christian, right? Well, yeah. Why would you go to a conference? I, I remember a guy at work, he was going to go on vacation, and he was telling the guys, I'm going to Israel. And I'm like, why would you want to go to Israel? On vacation? I'm like, come on, go to the beach or to the mountains, go skiing, a resort, a cruise. Israel? That makes no sense. There are Christians who think that about other Christians. Why are you always in church? Wait a minute, you're a Christian, right? Yeah. I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. I'm going to heaven. Okay, why don't you want to go to church? Something's not right here. Why would you want to go to a conference? Why would you want to go to Israel? You know, if you think like that, I challenge you to think about it. Examine your faith, whether you are half in the world and half in Christ, because that don't work. You, you read Revelation, right? Where Jesus said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Either Luke, If you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I want you hot or cold. And that hot or cold doesn't mean, mean totally on fire, burning for me, or just not at all. It means that you are hot when you need to be hot, and you are cold and kind when you need to be kind. Always on fire for the Lord, but you can't be lukewarm. Because you're half in the world and half in Christianity. It doesn't work like that. Something's wrong with your faith. You're not reading, you're not praying, you're really not seeking the Lord. And you know that. And so you need to change that. You need to turn that around and seek the Lord and get back walking with the Lord. Spurgeon said this, What a strange world this is. It speaks evil of men because they do not do evil. Isn't that strange? Here's the world. They speak evil of you because you're not doing evil things in the world. This is what Jesus said. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And John even said somewhere else, if the world loves you, ooh, then you don't know the Father. That's a scary thought. To, to say, but I've confessed him. Have you accepted him in your heart or is it religion? Is it religion? Do you think that you're saved because you go to church? Do you think you're saved because you give? Do you think you're saved because I said a prayer? Mm -mm. You're saved because your heart's been transformed. Because you have become a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things pass away. Behold, all things are new, the Bible says. That's a fact. That's a truth. And if the things aren't new, then something's not right. If the world does not hate you, then there's something radically wrong with you. 
See, the words here that Peter uses to describe the world is, is a dispensation of flood, of sinfulness, reckless extravagance, I mean galore. And it's the things that we as believers should not be living because Christians want to live a separated life, a pure life for the Lord, one that would glorify God completely. So willing to do whatever it takes to maintain that purity and that separation from the world. In Europe, uh, there are forests throughout Europe and Asia. And there's a little animal, and it's called a ermine. It's called an ermine. I don't know if you've heard of an ermine before, but it's a little white furry animal. And one of the things that, that ermines don't like is dirt. They like to keep white. And so if they get dirty, they'll, they'll spend hours cleaning themselves up so their fur is nice and clean and white. They like to show off the light of their whiteness and so forth. And in fact, uh, they'll do anything to protect that little white coat of theirs that they wear. Well, hunters will take advantage of this. And instead of just running after these ermine to chase them and down and grab them, uh, what they do is they find out where they live. And then usually they live in, the, in cliffs of rocks. And they'll go there first and when they know that they're gone and they'll throw mud all over the entrance of their little dens. And so then they send the dogs out and when they find this little ermine, they start chasing it and the ermine's going to run back home to hide in the cliffs of the rocks. Well, when the ermine sees the dirt, guess what? He stops. He doesn't go in because he's so concerned about his purity there that he does not want to defile himself at all. And so then they'll trap him and then they'll take him and then they'll use his fur. But the cost of keeping his purity, right? It's true of Christians that it cost. It cost us. It cost separation from the group that we hung around with. It cost us separation from sometimes our family members. It cost us something to stay separated and pure before the Lord. The Lord wants us to be separated from them. When people can't tolerate your belief or faith, what comes natural to them? Is they persecute you. It's a natural thing to do because they don't understand it. And so they make fun of it. They'll joke about it. And so he says, they speak evil of you. They speak evil of you. Believe me, they label you. Your family labels you. Those around you label you while you're not there. I've seen it plenty of times. You'll go to a family gathering and they'll all be at the table with their beer and alcohol and so forth and you come into the door and boom, conversation changes immediately. You know, and it changes. And, and you're looking for an opportunity to share Jesus and they're looking for an opportunity to tell off jokes. We had one family member that uh, he would mock us openly, but he would do it in such a way that he wasn't speaking to us. He was always speaking to everybody else. And he, and he would use obscene things, you know. And there you sit, just being a light. And smile, you know, and just think of nothing and just sharing Jesus. Because you know that they're condemned and God is going to judge them. You know, you'll hear things like, oh, here comes the holy roller. Here comes a Jesus freak. In fact, you wear a Jesus freak shirt. <laughs> and that's why they call you Jesus freak. Because you think yourselves a Jesus freak. Because you, know? you don't hide it. You're not ashamed of it. You know, when you go somewhere, you're willing to broadcast it, you know, with everyone else. We uh, went and had uh, dinner at um, the Panda Express here. Uh, Gabby and I before the youth night, and she invited a friend, and the friend's mother was there. And so we all sat down and, uh, to have dinner. And I always ask when I see strangers sitting with us, but I asked, would you mind if we pray? And she said, well, no, go ahead. And so I held Gabby's hand, and we prayed for the food. You, know? you have to be open with your Christianity, unless you're ashamed of it. And if you're ashamed of it, you're going to hide it. Well, I'm not ashamed of it. I just want to share with them because, you know, they're my friends. I don't want to offend them. Really? 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 Then you're ashamed of Jesus because you don't want to offend them. You're hiding Him because you think you're going to lose them. You don't need friends like that. You really don't. You need godly friends. Someone said, when we walk with the Lord, we'll be out of step with the world. That's true. 
you'll be out of step with the world. You're going to be in step with the world. You won't be. If you are a true believer, the world will not know you. They will think that you are a foreigner. You're a foreigner. Now, we shouldn't worry about it, though. We shouldn't worry about what people think about us. Though we do, right? (laughs) We still do. We're human. We don't like to hear the names. We don't like the fact that some people don't like us. I was sharing at one birthday party at my mom's house with with, with a lady that I had known all of my life. In fact, I, I had this connection with her as, as, as a cousin, you know, and so I always thought about her and her family and so forth when I was a little kid, when I grew up and so forth. So when I finally saw her after years and tens of years, I just wanted to speak with her. So I sat down and we just started talking and, I, and then I shared with her about Jesus. And at first she got excited because she was very Catholic. And so I was sharing about the Lord. And then she started sharing with me about some of the sacraments and things. And she goes, well, you guys believe that. And so I started sharing with her the truth. And she got mad and offended. And I could tell her demeanor changed. The expression on her face changed. I'm like, wow, she now hates me. Here's a person that I've loved to see in a long time and now she doesn't like me and it was within a matter of of a half an hour she's slowly turning away and she never spoke to me the rest of the night again because I was honest isn't that sad that we can't respect one another's faith or beliefs you know God God does not ask us to convert anybody that's his job we're to water and we're to plant seeds we're to share the truth then it's up to them to receive it or not it's their choice We're to love them. Let Jesus work in their lives. You can't change anybody's mind. They have to accept the truth. See, I have a lot of friends that are atheists, Catholics, different religions and so forth. I respect that. It's their choice. If they want to choose to believe that, great. I can still have a relationship with them. I'm not going to walk with them in this world. I'm not going to participate with them. If ever I go to a Catholic wedding, I don't participate in the ceremony. I don't bow my knees before idols. I don't light candles. I don't do that stuff anymore because I don't believe in that. Why can't you respect my faith? Why can't you respect what I believe? That's difficult for them to do because you don't believe what they believe. I can respect you. I can still love you. You know, I happen to believe the Bible is true. I happen to believe that if the Bible is true, then if you don't know Jesus Christ personally, then you'll be separated for eternity. That's what I believe, because it's what the Bible teaches. If you're a Catholic, you believe the Bible, read it for yourself. I'll guarantee you, because it's happened here in this church, and I've seen it over and over again, people have come up to me, say, I'm Catholic, you're not going to convert me. And I look at them and say, you're right, I will never try to convert you. I can't convert you. But if you stay here and you listen to the word and you follow along with your Catholic Bible, God will convert you. And you know how many times people have been converted from the Catholic faith to to the truth? Many, because you can't deny the words of God in the word of God. And you can use your Catholic Bible. I don't have a problem with that. So it's not me you're fighting. It's God you're fighting against. And you have to... You really have to believe that as a believer. But respect them. You love them. Why? Because ultimately, who's the judge? God is the judge. He's going to judge them. So don't worry about about your enemies. Don't worry about what they're saying. You just continue to love them. See, what happens is, one day they're going to suffer. One day they're going to go through some trials. But you've been so steadfast. You have been so loving. You've always been there. You've always cared. You've always shared. They see that commitment and relationship with Christ. So who do they go to first? You. Hey, um, <clears throat> could you pray for me? <laughs> they don't say, remember all those things I said? Can you forget those things, you know, and pray for me? You know, we forgot them already. You're already condemned. Why are you going to hold them accountable to that stuff? I know we do. And we have family members we don't like, we don't want to talk to, we don't want to see them, because they are just very bold, arrogant, you know, nasty people. But there'll come a time, can you pray for me? Oh, sure, I can. And you will see how God turns it around, how light is shunned into this dark place, and next thing you know is, is they're coming alongside you, and they're being saved. So, You're not to speak evil of them. Don't do that. Don't fall into that same trap. My dad used to always say, don't don't 
sink to their level, you know, rise above it, you know, stay the course. Uh, Ephesians 4, 31 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. It shouldn't be part of us as believers. Don't let that be. Uh, Timothy 3, 1 through 15, uh, Paul said, uh, speak evil of no one to avoid quarreling, uh, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. That's how we need to be towards one another. Lovingly and caringly so that God can handle it. Because He does handle it. It's His job. And He does a great job at it. He will, he will do His work and His part. We're the water and we are to plant seeds. Look at verse 5. They will give an account to Him who is ready to judge the living and dead. To who? To Him, to God. See, we will all stand before God one day. And we will all give an account whether you're living or whether you're dead. God will be our judge. The Bible is clear on that. And, and Peter's not saying this to condemn anyone. He's saying it with a heart of compassion that we're all in danger to be judged. And so be aware of that. How you treat one another, how you treat others. And, and for the world, they're condemned already and they will be judged before the Lord if they don't turn from their ways. Ecclesiastics 12.14 says, For God will bring every act into judgment. Everything you've done Whether good or whether evil, God will bring it into judgment. Beware of that. And so, we come to verse 6. I'm going to spend just a little bit more time on verse 6. Not much more than than we'll let you out here. But just a quick warning. Verse 6 here. Um, Some have said that this is probably one of the most difficult passages in the Bible to interpret. There's something like 20 different interpretations uh, someone brought to my attention that their commentary in their Bible said that there were four. That's not what I said, though. There are 20. I'm not saying they're all right. And they're extremely wrong and, and weird in their interpretations. But there's probably about four. I think there's only two possibilities. Uh, so I'm going to share with you at least those two. I'm not going to get into all 20. But let me share one with you that I think you need to be careful of. But you need to be like Paul said or. Yeah, Paul said it to the, uh, concerning the Bereans, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, that we are to be like the Bereans. They check the scriptures to see if these things are true or not. That is our responsibility as believers. You have a responsibility that when I get up here and teach, anybody teaches, that, that what I say should be aligned with what the Word of God is saying, and that I don't go beyond those limits. And I think that you know, at least here, that I stick with the Word of God and what it says and expounds on that. Uh, that first verse is very clear. You know, uh, um, people are going to think you're strange because of your faith in Christ, because you don't walk with Him anymore. It's pretty clear. I could have just read it and you would have understood it, right? But I wanted to stick because I know some of you struggle with this, with your families and friends, you know, and it's very difficult. It's hard to have people hate you or not like you because of your Christianity. And so I'm encouraging you, hang on, because there's a purpose through it. God will use you to minister to them in the long run when you are faithful to stay with Him. So keeping this in context, now what's the error of this interpretation? There is a, a teaching that, that says that if you die, that you still have a second chance to go to heaven. Now, Catholicism has something similar to that. They believe in what they call purgatory. That when you die, you go to this place called purgatory, and hopefully your family can pray you into heaven. I had a friend uh, from high school who just posted his mom just died. And first thing he wrote on there, could you please pray for her soul that she could go to heaven? So obviously he believes that she's in purgatory. And they're having a rosary to pray for her that hopefully she will get to heaven. So of course, I don't believe in that. And so I put scripture. And I said, anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is in the presence of the Lord already. And I pray for you. And your family. I didn't pray for her mom because it's too late for her. Whether she's before God or not, I don't know. And I'm not going to say. That's between her and God. But I don't believe in purgatory. I don't believe that you have a second chance. Why don't you believe that? The Pope said it. Other people say it. I, I don't care what the Pope says. I don't care what people say. I don't care what you say. I want to know what the Bible says. In Hebrews 9 is very clear. Verse 27. It's appointed unto man to die once... And then the judgment. Once you die, and then the judgment. That's very clear. 
And so anything other than that is untrue in my eyes because the Bible is true from beginning to end. And so that interpretation of this verse is incorrect. So in verse 6 he says, For this reason the gospel, the good news, was preached also to those who are dead. Now that's a question mark. Who are those who are dead? That they might be judged according to men in the flesh. What does that mean, being judged according to men in the flesh? But, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now that's clear in the presence of the Lord in heaven, in the Spirit. As the Bible teaches all over, absent from this body is in the presence of the Lord. So Paul said in Galatians, that in a twinkling of an eye, that we will go up to heaven and our bodies will be caught up later on during the rapture and we'll put on this immortal body with the Lord. It hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. Our bodies are still in the grave. They turn back to dust, you know, and they're waiting there until that day happens and then we are going to meet the Lord in the air. So let's break this up. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. There's two possibilities here. Obviously, this person that's dead, it doesn't say that are dying or that have been dead for a while. It's just they're dead. So it could be that they were alive. They heard the gospel. They received the gospel. And now they're, they're dead. And so they will be in the presence of the Lord in heaven because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay? Some believe that these believers were martyrs. Because they're living in a time where Nero was persecuting them. And many of them were dying for their faith. So it could be that they died for their faith. Now, the reference to uh, the flesh here in the next statement, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, this is a reference to physical death. Physical death. So again, their body physically dying. Now, how were they judged? He had just said that those who were dead... Those who were dead. So again, possibly those who were martyred for their Christian faith. Now, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. That's a great possibility, and it sounds like it might fit, you know, but they're alive according to the Spirit of God. So how do we interpret this, this scripture? There's, a, there's another possibility that I'm going to talk about. Remember this. Always keep things in context. Always keep things in context. It's kind of like our Constitution, it is just so amazing how people misinterpret the Constitution. When you look at the context of the time that it was written by the forefathers, it's easy to interpret it. But you pull it out of context and you, you try to interpret it by the, today's time and culture, yeah, you create a whole new law to try to interpret that Constitution. And then you have another law to interpret that law, and that law needs another law to interpret it. And it gets crazy. Instead of just sticking with the context... You know, you get this battle of all our forefathers were not believers in God. You know, and so now if we can discredit our forefathers as not being believers, not being Christians, then we can get a different interpretation. But if you believe that they were believers, and I do, if you believe they had faith and trust in Christ, which I do, then you understand the context of the Constitution. When they're saying the separation of church and state, they're talking about keeping the state out of the church, not the church out of the state. It's very clear. And in fact, that's not even in the Constitution. That was written on a piece of paper, the, what they call the, the Beer Berries document of something like that. Not even in the Constitution, but they use it and they say it as though it's in the Constitution. The world thinks it's in the Constitution. So as soon as the church says something, they say, oh no, separation of church and state, that's the Constitution. No, it's not. Read your Constitution and stop believing men. Read it for yourself. You know, it's a lie. Got to stick in context. The context here is suffering. Christians are dying. That's the context. In fact, if you go back to chapter 3, I think it's verse 18, you remember that Jesus actually visited the, the, the dead who were in prison to judge them, to preach a judgment. So could it be, the second interpretation, is that Jesus is talking about the gospel going to those that are in that prison, message to those that are in that, um, are in Abraham's bosom. You remember there's a great gulf separating Lazarus. And you remember that uh, Lazarus asked for, for Abraham to come over and put some water on his lips, the evidence. Jesus gave this parable to tell us that hell is real. You know, and, and so he preached to 
those that were dead, the gospel, to the Old Testament prophets, and then they all entered into paradise in the presence of the Lord, alive in the Spirit. So that could be another interpretation. I'm not sure which one I lean towards. You know, I'm kind of, it could be either one. It could be both. But you know what, be like a Berean. I leave that up to you. You know, read it over, do some research, look at those wacky ones, and if you want to believe in one of those, it's fine too. Um, it doesn't really af- affect your salvation in any way. You know, Peter's giving us a scenario that took place with those who had died, whether martyrs or whether they were in this holding place. Let me close up. If you decide to live godly as believers, expect to suffer persecution. Expect it. Don't be surprised by it. If your family mocks your neighbor's monkey, don't be surprised. It's part of the package. They will persecute you. If you are believers and you are walking with the world, get out before it's too late. Get out. It's not worth it. It's not worth your self-esteem, what you think you might need because you have these kind of friends. It's not worth it. It's better to have godly friends. Friends that will encourage you and strengthen you spiritually. That will lead you and direct you in godly ways. That will lead to spiritual rewards and not to wastefulness. Wastefulness in life. That's just a waste of time. It's like Disneyland. I'm not against Disneyland. I like Disneyland. It's the most happiest place in the world. And it is. I love Disneyland. But it sure is a waste of time, isn't it? When you really think about it, it's a waste of time. You go down there and you go, I wasted the whole day here doing nothing. Getting on rise, screaming and yelling. It can hardly talk. It is a waste of time. But we can enjoy it too. We have that liberty. But realize there are things that we just waste. That's part of life. I've wasted a lot of things. Believe me, a lot of things that I've wasted. And I wish I could take back. I can't. And I'm sure I'll, I'll waste, waste other time sitting there watching a football game. What a wasteful life. <laughs> watching a football game. A bunch of guys hitting each other, you know, for a little ball. <laughs> uh, some of you understand that. Some of you don't. They're getting mad at me right now. <laughs> what does it take to become a Christian? Let, let me say this really clear. It takes a willingness to give up sin. It takes a willingness to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Oswald Chambers said it this way, being born again by the Spirit of God means that we must first be willing to let go before we can grasp something else. Before we can grasp something else. You have to be willing to let go of your old life, your life completely for a new life in Christ. And it is a new life. And Christ has a great life for you. A wonderful life. With his presence and his leading, how can you go wrong with God? If he is God and knows beginning to end, he has beautiful things for you. You just have to let go of your life and let him.